From Los Angeles, California, the entertainment capital of the world, it's the 80s Movie Podcast. I am your host, Edward Havens. Thank you for listening today. Have you ever thought, I should do this thing, but then you never get around to it until something completely random happens that reminds you that you were going to do this thing a long time ago? For this week's episode, that kick in the keister was a post on Twitter from someone I don't follow being retweeted by the great film critic and essayist Walter Chaw, someone I do follow, that showed a Blu-ray cover of the 1987 Walter Hill film Extreme Prejudice. You see, Walter Chaw has recently released a book about the life and career of Walter Hill, and this other person was showing off their new purchase. That, in and of itself, wasn't the kick in the butt. That was the logo of the disc's distributor, Bestron Video, a company that went out of business more than 30 years ago. That, unbeknownst to me, had been resurrected by the current owner of the trademark Lionsgate film as a specialty label for a certain type of film, like Ken Russell's Gothic, Beyond Reanimator, Chud 2, and for some reason, Walter Hill's Neo Western featuring Nick Nolte, Powers Booth, and Rip Torn. For those of you from the 1980s, you remember at least one of the Vestron Pictures movies, I guarantee it. But before we get there, we, as always, must go a little further back in time. The year is 1981. Time magazine is amongst the most popular magazines in the entire world, while their sister publication Life was renowned for their stunning photographs printed on glossy color paper of a larger size than most magazines. In the late 1970s, Time Life added a video production and distribution company to their ever-growing media empire that also included television stations, cable channels, book clubs, and compilation record box sets. But Time Life Home Video didn't quite take off the way the company had expected, and they decided to concentrate on its lucrative cable businesses like HBO. The company would move Austin First, an executive from HBO, over to dismantle the assets of Time Life Films. And while First would sell off the production and distribution parts of the company to Fox and the television department to Columbia Pictures, he couldn't find a party interested in the home video department. Recognizing that home video was an emerging market that would need a visionary like himself, willing to take big risks for the chance to have big rewards, first purchased the home video rights to the film and video library for himself, starting up his own home entertainment company. But what to call the company? It would be his daughter that would come up with Vestron, a portmanteau of combining the names of the Roman goddess of the heart, Vesta, with Tron, the Greek word for instrument. Remember, the movie Tron would not be released for another year at this point. At first, there were only two employees at Vestron, first himself and John Pessinger, a fellow executive at Time Life who, not unlike Dorothy Boyd and Jerry Maguire, was the only person who saw First's long-term vision for the future. Outside of the titles they brought with them from Time Life, Vestron's initial release of home video titles comprised of a few mid-range movie hits where they were able to snag those home video rights instead of the companies that released those movies in the theaters, either because those companies did not have a home video operation yet, or they did not negotiate for home video rights when making the movie deal with the producers. In addition to Fort Apache the Bronx, a crime drama with Paul Newman and Ed Asner, and Loving Couples, a Shirley MacLaine, James Coburn romantic comedy that was neither romantic nor comedic, both which were Time Life Productions, Vestron would also acquire the Burt Reynolds Dom DeLuise comedy The Cannonball Run, which was a pickup from a Hong Kong production company called Golden Harvest, which financed the comedy to help break their local star Jackie Chan into the American market. They would also make a deal with several Canadian production companies to get the American home video rights to titles like the Jack Lemmon drama Tribute and the George C. Scott horror film The Changeling. The advantage that Vestron had over the major studios was their outlook on the mom-and-pop rental stores that were popping up in every city and town in the United States. The major studios hated the idea that they could sell a videotape for, say, $99.99 and then see someone else make a major profit by renting that tape out of 50 or 100 times at 4 or $5 per night. Of course, they would eventually see the light, but in 1981 and 1982, they weren't quite there yet. Now, let me sidetrack for a moment, as I am wont to do, to talk about mom-and-pop video stores in the early 1980s. 
If you're younger than, say, 40, you probably only know Blockbuster and or Hollywood Video as your local video rental store. But in the early 1980s, there were no national video store chains yet. The first Blockbuster wouldn't open until October of 1985 in Dallas, and your neighborhood likely didn't get one until the late 80s or early 1990s. The first video store I ever encountered, Telford Home Video in Belmont Shores, Long Beach, in 1981, was operated by Bob Telford, an actor best known for playing the station master in both the original 1974 version of Where the Red Fern Grows and its 2003 remake. Bob was really cool, and I don't think it was just because the space for the video store was just below my dad's office in the real estate company building that they had built and operated. Bob genuinely took interest in this weird 13-year-old kid who had an encyclopedic knowledge of films and wanted to learn more. I wanted to watch every movie he had in the store that I hadn't seen, but there was one problem. We had a VHS machine at home, while most of Bob's inventory were RCA Select Division, a disc-based playback system using a special stylus and groove-covered disc, much like an LP record. After school each day, I'd hightail it over to Telford Home Video, and Bob and I would watch a movie while we waited for customers to come and rent something. It was with Bob that I would watch Ordinary People and The Magnificent Seven, The Elephant Man and The Last Waltz, Bus Stop and Rebel Without a Cause, and The French Connection and The Man Who Fell to Earth, and a bunch of other great movies that weren't yet available on VHS. It was great. Like many teenagers in the early 1980s, I spent some time working at a mom-and-pop video store. Mine was Seacliff Home Video in Aptos, California. I worked on the weekends. It was a third of a mile of a walk from my house, and even though I was only 16 years old at the time, my bosses would, every week, solicit my opinion about which upcoming videos they should acquire. Because like Telford Home Video and Village Home Video, where my friends Dick and Michelle worked about two miles away, and most every video store at the time, space was extremely limited. And there was only room for so many titles. Telford Home Video was about 500 square feet and had maybe 500 titles. Seacliff Home Video was about 750 square feet and had around 800 titles, including about 50 in this tiny curtained-off room created to hold the porn. And the first location for Village Home Video only had 300 square feet of space and only about 250 titles. The owner, Leona Keller, confirmed this to me that until they moved into a larger location across from the original store, they were able to rent out every single movie in the store every night. For many, a store owner had to be very careful about what they ordered and what they replaced. But Vestron Home Video always seemed to have some of the better movies. Because of a spat between Warner Brothers and Orion Pictures, Vestron would end up releasing most of Orion's movies from 1983 through 1985, including Rodney Dangerfield's Easy Money, the Nick Nolte political thriller Under Fire, the William Hurt mystery Gorky Park, and Gene Wilder's The Woman in Red. They'd also make a deal with Roger Corman's old American independent pictures outfit, which would reap an unexpected bounty when George Miller's second Mad Max movie, The Road Warrior, became a surprise hit in 1982. And Vestron was holding the video rights to the first Mad Max movie. And they'd also find themselves with the Laserdisc rights to several Brian De Palma movies, including Dress to Kill and Blowout. And after Polygram Films decided to leave the movie business in 1984, they would sell the home video rights to An American Werewolf in London and Endless Love to Vestron. They were doing pretty good. And then in 1984, Vestron ended up changing the home video industry forever. When Michael Jackson and John Landis had trouble with Jackson's record company, Epic, getting their idea for a 14-minute short film built around the title song to Jackson's monster album Thriller financed, Vestron would put up a good portion of the nearly million-dollar budget in order to release the movie on home video, after it played for a few weeks on MTV. In February of 1984, Vestron would release a one-hour tape, The Making of Michael Jackson's Thriller, that included the mini-movie and a 45-minute making of featurette. At $29.99, it would be one of the first sell-through titles released on home video. And it would become the second home videotape to sell a million copies after Star Wars. Suddenly, Vastron was flush with more cash than they knew what to do with. In 1985, they would decide to expand their entertainment footprint 
by opening Bestron Pictures, which would finance a number of movies that could be exploited across a number of platforms, including theatrical, home video, cable, and syndicated TV. In early January of 1986, Bestron would announce that they were pursuing projects with three producers, Steve Tisch, Larry Terman, and Gene Kirkwood, but no details on any specific titles or even a time frame when any of those movies would be made. Tish, the son of Lois Entertainment co-owner Bob Tish, had started producing films in 1977 with the Peter Fonda music drama Outlaw Blues and had a big hit in 1983 with Risky Business. Terman, the Oscar-nominated producer of Mike Nichols' Graduate, and Kirkwood, the producer of The Keep and The Pope of Greenwich Village, had seen better days as producers by 1986, but their names still carried a certain cachet in Hollywood, and the announcement would certainly let the industry know that Vestron was serious about making quality movies. Well, maybe not all quality movies. They would also launch a sub-label for Vestron Pictures called Lightning Pictures, which would be utilized on B-movies and schlock that maybe wouldn't fit in with the Vestron Pictures brand name that they were trying to build. But it takes a lot of money to build a movie production and theatrical distribution company. Lots of money. Thanks to an ever-growing roster of video titles and the success of recent releases like Thriller, Vestron would go public in the spring of 1985, selling enough shares on the first day of trading to bring in $440 million to the company, $140 million more than they thought they would sell that day. It would take them a while, but in 1986 they would start production on their first slate of films, as well as acquire several foreign titles for American distribution. Vestron Pictures officially entered the theatrical distribution game on July 18, 1986, when they released the Australian comedy Malcolm at the Cinema 2 on the Upper East Side of New York City. A modern attempt to create the Aussie version of a Jacques Tati-like absurdist comedy about modern life and our dependence on gadgetry, Malcolm follows, as one character describes him, a 100% not-their individual who was tricked into using some of his remote control inventions to pull off a bank robbery. While the film would be a minor hit in Australia, and win all eight of the Australian Film Institute Awards it was nominated for, including Best Picture, Director, Screenplay, and three acting awards, the film would only play for five weeks in New York City, grossing less than $35,000, and it wouldn't even open in Los Angeles until November 5th, where, in its first week at the Cineplex Beverly Center and the Samuel Goldwyn Pavilion Cinemas, it would gross a combined $37,000 in the first three days. Go figure. Malcolm would open in a few more major markets, but Vestron would close the film at the end of the year with a gross of just under $200,000. Their next film, Slaughter High, was a rather odd bird. A co-production between American and British-based production companies, the film followed a group of adults responsible for a prank gone wrong on April Fool's Day who were invited to a reunion at their defunct high school, where a mass killer awaits inside. And although the movie takes place in America, the film was shot in London and nearby Virginia Water, Surrey in late 1984, under the title April Fool's Day. But even with Caroline Monroe, the British sex symbol who had become a cult favorite with her appearances in a series of sci-fi and hammer horror films with Peter Cushing and or Christopher Lee, as well as her work in the Bond film The Spy Who Loved Me, April Fool's Day would sit on the proverbial shelf for nearly two years, until Vestron picked it up and changed its title, since Paramount Pictures had already released their own horror movie called April Fool's Day earlier that year. Vestron would open Slaughter High on nine screens in Detroit on November 14, 1986, but Vestron would not report grosses for it. They then would open it on six screens in St. Louis on February 13, 1987. At least this time, they reported a gross, $12,400. Variety would simply call that number grim. They'd give the film one final rush on April 24th, sending it out to 38 screens in New York City, where it would gross $90,000. There would be no second week, as practically every theater would replace it with Creep Show 2. The third and final Vestron film release for 1986 was Billy Galvin, a little-remembered family drama featuring Carl Malden and Lenny Von Dolan, originally produced for the PBS anthology series American Playhouse, 
but bumped up to a feature film as part of a coordinated effort to promote the show by occasionally releasing feature films bearing the American Playhouse banner. The film would open at the Cineplex Beverly Center on December 31st, not only the last day of the calendar year, but the last day a film can be released into theaters in Los Angeles to be considered for Academy Awards. The film would not get any major awards from the Academy or anyone else, nor much attention from audiences, grossing just $4,000 in its first five days. They'd give the film a chance in New York on February 20th at the 23rd Street West Triplex, but a $2,000 opening weekend gross would doom the film from ever opening in another theater again. In early 1987, Vestron announced 18 films that they would release during the year, and a partnership with AMC and General Cinema Theaters to have their films featured in those two companies' pilot specialized film programs in major markets like Dallas, Denver, Detroit, Houston, and San Francisco. Alpine Fire would be the first of those films arriving at the Cinema Studio One in New York City on February 20th, a Swiss drama about a young, deaf, and mentally challenged teenager who gets his older sister pregnant, was the country's entry into the Best Foreign Language Film Oscar race. While the film would win the Golden Leopard Award at the 1985 Locarno Film Festival, the Academy would not select the film for a nomination, and the film would quickly disappear from theaters after a $2,000 opening weekend gross. Personal Services, the first film to be directed by Terry Jones outside of his services with Monty Python, would arrive in American theaters on May 15th. The only Jones-directed film to not feature any other Python in the cast, Personal Services was a thinly disguised retelling of a 1970s-era London waitress who was running a brothel in her flat in order to make ends meet, and featured a standout performance by Julie Walters as the waitress-turned-madam. In England, Personal Services would be the second highest-grossing film of the year, behind The Living Daylights, the first Bond film featuring new 007 Timothy Dalton. In America, the film wouldn't be quite as successful, grossing $1.75 million after 33 weeks in theaters, despite never playing on more than 31 screens in any given week. It would be another three months before Bestron would release their third movie of the year, but it would become the one they'd become famous for. Dirty Dancing Based in large part on screenwriter Eleanor Bergstein's own childhood, the screenplay would be written after the producers of the 1980 Michael Douglas Jill Clayburgh dramedy It's My Turn asked the writer to remove a scene from the screenplay that involved an erotic dance sequence. She would take that scene and use it as a jumping-off point for a news story about a Jewish teenager in the early 1960s who participates in secret dirty dancing competitions while she vacations with her doctor father and stay-at-home mother in the Catskill Mountains. Baby, the young woman at the center of the story, would not only resemble the screenwriter as a character, but share her childhood nickname. Bergstein would pitch the story to every studio in Hollywood in 1984, and would only get a nibble from MGM Pictures, whose name was synonymous with big-budget musicals decades before. They would option the screenplay and assign producer Linda Gottlieb, a veteran television producer making her first major foray into feature films, to the project. With Gottlieb, Bergstein would head back to the Catskills for the first time in two decades as research for the script. It was while on this trip that the pair would meet Michael Terrace, a former Broadway dancer who had spent summers in the early 1960s teaching tourists how to mambo in the Catskills. Terrace and Bergstein didn't remember each other if they'd ever met way back then, but his stories would help inform the lead male character of Johnny Castle. But as regularly happens in Hollywood, there was a regime change at MGM in late 1985, and one of the projects the new bosses cut loose was Dirty Dancing. Once again, the script would make the rounds in Hollywood, but nobody was biting again, until Bestron Pictures got their chance to read it. They loved it, and they were ready to make it its first in-house production. But they would make the movie if the budget could be cut from $10 million to four and a half. That would mean some sacrifices. They wouldn't be able to hire a major director, nor bigger name actors, but that would end up being a blessing in disguise. To direct, Gottlieb and Bergstein looked at a lot of up-and-coming feature directors, but the one person that they had the best feeling about was Emil Ardolino, 
a former actor off Broadway in the 1960s who began his filmmaking career as a documentarian for PBS in the 1970s. In 1983, Ardolino's documentary about National Dance Institute founder Jacques Dambois, He Makes Me Feel Like Dancing, would win both the Academy Award for Best Documentary Feature and the Emmy Award for Outstanding Children's Entertainment Special. Although Ardolino had never directed a dramatic narrative, he would read the script twice in a week while serving on jury duty in Los Angeles, and came back to Gottlieb and Bergstein with a number of ideas to help them make a movie shine, even at half the budget. For a movie about dancing, with a lot of dancing in it, they would need a creative choreographer to help train the actors and design the sequences. The filmmakers would choose Kenny Ortega, who, in addition to choreographing the dance scenes in Pretty in Pink and Ferris Bueller's Day Off, had worked with Gene Kelly on the 1980 musical Xanadu, well, more specifically, was molded by Gene Kelly to become the lead choreographer for the film. That's some good credentials. And unlike movies like Flashdance, where the filmmakers would hire Jennifer Beals to play Alex and Maureen Jahan to perform Alex's dance scenes, Ardolino was insistent that the actors playing the dancers were actors who could also dance. Having stand-ins would take extra time to set up and would suck up a portion of the already tight budget. Yet, the first people he would meet for the lead role of Johnny were non-dancers Benicio Del Toro, Val Kilmer, and Billy Zane. Zane would go so far as to do a screen test with one of the actresses being considered for the role of Baby, Jennifer Grey. But after screening the test, they realized Grey was right for Baby, but Zane was not right for Johnny. Someone suggested Patrick Swayze, a former dancer for the prestigious Joffrey Ballet, who was making his way up the ranks of stardom thanks to his roles in The Outsiders and Grandview, USA. But Swayze had suffered a knee injury years before that put his dance career on hold, and there were concerns he would re-aggravate his injury. And there were concerns from Jennifer Grey, because she and Swayze had not gotten along very well while working on Red Dawn. But that had been three years earlier, and when they screen-tested together here, Everyone was convinced that this was the pairing that would bring magic to the movie. Baby's parents would be played by two Broadway veterans, Jerry Orbach, who is best known today as Detective Lenny Briscoe on Law & Order, and Kelly Bishop, who is best known today as Emily Gilmore on The Gilmore Girls, but had actually started out as a dancer, singer, and actor, winning a Tony Award for her role in the original Broadway production of A Chorus Line. Bishop had originally been cast in a different role for the movie, as another guest in the Catskill Resorts with the Hausmans, but she would be bumped up when the original Mrs. Hausman, Lynn Lipton, would fall ill during the first week of filming. Filming on Dirty Dancing would begin in North Carolina on September 5, 1986, at a former Boy Scout camp that had been converted to a private residential community. This is where many of the iconic scenes from the film would be shot, including Baby carrying the watermelon and practicing her dance steps on the stairs, all the interior dance scenes, the famous log scene, and the golf course scene where Baby would ask her father for $250. It's also where Patrick Swayze almost ended his role in the film, when he would indeed re-injure his knee during the balancing scene on the log. He would be rushed to the hospital to have fluid drained from the swelling. Thankfully, there would be no lingering effects once he was released. After filming in North Carolina was completed, the team would move to Virginia for two more weeks of filming, including the water lift scene, exteriors at Kellerman's Hotel, and the Hausman's family cabin, before the film was wrapped on October 27th. Ardolino's first cut of the film would be completed in February 1987, and Vestron would begin the process of running a series of test screenings. At the first test screening, nearly 40% of the audience didn't realize there was an abortion subplot in the movie even after completing the movie. A few weeks later, Vestron executives would screen the film for producer Aaron Russo, who would produce such movies as The Rose and Trading Places. His reaction to the film was to tell the executives to burn the negative and collect the insurance. But to be fair, there was one important element of the film that was still not set. The music. Eleanor Bergstein had written into her script a number of songs that were popular in the early 1960s when the movie was set, that she felt the final film needed. Except a number of the songs were a bit more expensive to license than Vestron would have preferred. 
the company was testing the film with different versions of those songs. Other artists' renditions. The writer, with the support of her producer and director, fought back. She made a deal with the Vestron executives. They would play her the master tracks to ten songs that she wanted, as well as the copycat versions. If she could properly identify six of the masters, she could have all ten songs in the film. Vestron would spend another half a million dollars licensing the original recordings because the writer nailed all ten. But even then, there was still one missing piece of the puzzle. The closing song. While Bergstein wanted another song to close the film, the team at Vestron was insistent on a new song that could be used to anchor a soundtrack album. The writer, producer, director, and various members of the production team listened to dozens of submissions from songwriters, but none of them felt right, until they literally got to the last submission left, written by Frankie Previtt, who had written another song that would end up appearing on the Dirty Dancing soundtrack, Hungry Eyes. Everybody loved the song called I've Had the Time of My Life, and it would take some time to convince Previtt that Dirt Dancing was not a porno. They showed him the film and he agreed to give them the song, but the production team at Vestron wanted to get a pair of more famous singers to record the final version. The filmmakers originally approached disco queen Donna Summer and Joe Esposito, whose song You're the Best appeared on the Karate Kid soundtrack but Summer would decline, not liking the title of the movie. They would then approach Daryl Hall from Hall & Oates and Kim Carnes, but they'd both decline, citing concerns about the title of the movie. Then they approached Bill Medley, one half of the Righteous Brothers, who enjoyed yet another career resurgence when You Lost That Love and Feeling became a hit in 1986 thanks to Top Gun, but at first he would also decline. Not he had any concerns about the title of the film, although he did have concerns about the title, but that his wife was about to give birth to their daughter, and he had promised he would be there. While trying to figure out who was going to sing the male lead of the song, the music supervisor for the film approached Jennifer Warnes, who had sung the duet Up Where We Belong from the Officer and a Gentleman soundtrack, which had won the 1983 Academy Award for Best Original Song, and sang the song for It Goes Like It Goes from the Norma Ray soundtrack, which had won the 1980 Academy Award for Best Original Song. Warnes wasn't thrilled with the song, but she would be persuaded to record the song for the right price, and if Bill Medley would sing the other part. Medley, flattered with that Warnes had specifically asked to record with him, said he would do so after his daughter was born, and if the song was recorded in his studio in Los Angeles. A few weeks later, Medley and Warnes would have their portion of the song completed in only one hour, including additional harmonies and flourishes decided on after finishing with the main vocals. With all the songs added to the movie, audience test scores improved considerably. RCA Records, who had been contracted to handle the release of the soundtrack, would set a July 17th release date for the album to coincide with the release of the movie on the same day, with the lead single, I've Had the Time of My Life, released one week earlier. But then Vestron moved the movie back from July 17th to August 21st and forgot to tell RCA Records about the move. No big deal, the song would quickly rise up the charts, eventually hitting number one on the Billboard charts. When the movie finally did open in 975 theaters on August 21st, it would open to fourth place with $3.9 million in ticket sales, behind Can't Buy Me Love in third place in its second week of release, the Chichmarin comedy Born in East L.A., which opened in second place, and Stakeout, which was enjoying its third week atop the charts. The reviews were okay for the film, but not special. Gene Siskel would give the film a begrudging thumbs up, citing Jennifer Grey's performance and her character arc as the thing that tipped the scale into the positive, while Roger Ebert would give the film a thumbs down due to its, quote, idiotic plot and tired and relentlessly predictable story of love between kids from different backgrounds, unquote. But then a funny thing happened. Instead of appealing to the teenagers they thought that would see this film, the majority of the audience ended up becoming adults. Not just 20 and 30-somethings, but people who were teenagers themselves during the movie's time frame. They would be drawn in to the film through the newfound sense of boomer nostalgia 
that had helped make Stand By Me an unexpected hit the year before, both as a movie and as a soundtrack. Its second week in theaters would only see the gross drop 6%, and the film would finish in third place. In week three, the four-day Labor Day weekend, it would gross nearly $5 million and move up to second place. And it would continue to play and continue to bring audiences in, only dropping out of the top ten once in early November for one weekend between August and December. And even with all the new movies that were entering the marketplace for Christmas, Dirty Dancing would be retained by most of the theaters that it was playing in. In the first weekend of 1988, Dirty Dancing was still playing in 855 theaters, only 120 fewer than had opened the movie five months earlier. Once it did start leaving first-run theaters, dollar houses were eager to pick it up, and Dirty Dancing would make another $6 million in ticket sales, and would continue to play until Christmas of 1988 at some theaters, finishing its incredible run with $63.5 million in ticket sales. Yet, despite its ubiquitousness, In American pop culture, despite the soundtrack selling more than 10 million copies in the first year, despite the uptick in attendance at dance schools from coast to coast, Dirty Dancing was never once the number one film in America on any weekend it was playing in theaters. There would always be at least one other movie that would do just a bit better. When award season came around, the movie was practically ignored by critics groups. It would pick up an Independent Spirit Award for Best First Feature, and both the movie and Jennifer Grey would be nominated for Golden Globes. But it would be the song, I've Had the Time of My Life, that would be the driver for awards love. It would win the Academy Award and the Golden Globe for Best Original Song, and a Grammy for Best Pop Performance by a duo or group with vocals. The song would anchor a soundtrack that also included two other hit songs, Eric Carmen's version of Hungry Eyes, and She's Like the Wind, recorded for the movie by Patrick Swayze making him the proto-Hugh Jackman of the 1980s. I've seen Hugh Jackman do his one-man show at the Hollywood Bowl, and now I'm kind of wishing that Patrick Swayze could have had something like that 30 years ago. On September 25th, they would release Abel Ferreira's neo-noir romantic thriller China Girl, a modern-day adaptation of Romeo and Juliet written by regular Ferreira writer Nicholas St. John. The setting would be New York City's Lower East Side, where Tony a teenager from Little Illily, falls for Ty, a teenager from Chinatown, as their older brothers vie for turf in a vicious gang war. While the stars of the film, Richard Panabianco and Sari Chang, would never become known actors, the supporting cast is as good as you would expect from a post-Miss 45 for a film, including James Russo, Russell Wong, David Caruso, and James Hong. The $3.5 million movie would open on 110 screens, including 70 in the New York Tri-State area and 18 in Los Angeles, grossing $531,000. After a second weekend, where the gross dropped to $225,000, Vestron would stop tracking the film, with a final reported gross of just $1.26 million, coming from a stockholder report in early 1988. Ironically, China Girl would open against another movie that Vestron had a hand in financing, but would not release in America, Rob Reiner's The Princess Bride. While the film would do okay in America, grossing $30 million against its $15 million budget, that wouldn't translate so easily to foreign markets. Anna, from first-time Polish filmmaker Jurek Wojciewicz, was an oddball little film from the start. The story, co-written with the legendary Polish writer-director Agnieszka Holland, was based on the real-life friendship of Polish actress Joanna Patsua and Elzbieta Czeweska, and would find Czech supermodel Paulina Portskova making her feature acting debut as Christina, an aspiring actress from Czechoslovakia, who goes to New York to find her idol Anna, who had been imprisoned and then deported for speaking out against the new regime after the 1968 communist invasion. Nearly 20 years later, the middle-aged Anna struggles to land any acting parts in films, on television, or on the stage, and relishes the attention of this beautiful young waif who reminds her of herself back then. Sally Kirkland, an American actress who got her start as part of Andy Warhol's factory in the early 1960s, but could never break out of playing supporting roles in movies like The Way We Were, The Sting, A Star is Born, and Private Benjamin, would be cast as the faded Czech star whose life seems 
to unintentionally mirror the actual actress's life. Future Snakes on a Plane director David R. Ellis would be featured in a small supporting role, as would the then 16-year-old Sofia Coppola. The $1 million movie would shoot on location in New York City during the winter of late 1986 and early 1987 and would make its world premiere at the 1987 New York Film Festival in September before opening at the 68th Street Playhouse on the Upper East Side on October 30th. Critics such as Bruce Williamson of Playboy, Molly Haskell of Vogue, and Jamie Bernard of the New York Post would sing the praises of the movie and of Paulina Portskova, but it would be Sally Kirkland whom practically every critic would gush over. A performance of depth and clarity and power, easily one of the strongest female roles of the year, wrote Mike McGrady of Newsday. Janet Maslin wasn't as impressed with the film as most critics, but she would note Miss Kirkland's immensely dignified presence in the title role. New York audiences responded well to the critical acclaim, buying more than $22,000 worth of tickets in the first three days, often playing to sell out crowds for the afternoon and evening shows. In its second week, the film would see its gross increase 12%, and another 3% increase in its third week. Meanwhile, on November 13th, the film would open in Los Angeles at the AMC Century City 14, where it would bring in an additional $10,000, thanks in part to Sheila Benson's rave in the Los Angeles Times, calling the film the best kind of surprise, a small, frequently funny, find-bone film set in the worlds of theater and movies, which unexpectedly becomes a consummate study of love, alienation, and loss while she praised Kirkland's performance as a blazing comet. Kirkland would make the rounds on the award circuit, winning Best Actress awards from the Los Angeles Films Critics Association, the Golden Globes, and the Independent Spirit Awards, culminating in an Academy Award nomination for Best Actress, although she would lose to Cher in Moonstruck. But, despite all these rave reviews and the early support of the film in New York and Los Angeles, the film got little traction outside of these two major cities. It would play in theaters for nearly six months, but Anna could only round up about $1.2 million in ticket sales. Bestron's second-to-last new film of 1987 would be a movie that, when it was shot in Namibia in late 1986, was titled Peacekeeper, then was changed to Desert Warrior when it was acquired by Jerry Weintraub's eponymously named distribution company, then saw it renamed again to Steel Dawn when Vestron overpaid to acquire the film from Weintraub because they wanted the next film starring Patrick Swayze for themselves. Swayze plays, and stop me if you've heard this one before, a warrior wandering through a post-apocalyptic desert who comes across a group of settlers who are being menaced by the leader of a murderous gang who's after the water they control. Lisa Niemi, also known as Mrs. Patrick Swayze, would be his romantic interest in the film, which would also star Anthony Zerby, Ryan James, and in one of his very first acting roles, future Mummy co-star Arnold Voslo. The film would open on November 6th to horrible reviews and gross just $312,000 in 290 theaters. For comparison's sake, Dirty Dancing was in its 11th week of release. It was still playing in 878 theaters, and it would gross $1.7 million the same weekend. In its second week, Steel Dawn had lost nearly two-thirds of its opening weekend theaters and grossed only $60,000 from 107 theaters. After its third weekend, Vestron stopped reporting the grosses. The film had only earned $562,000 in ticket sales. And their final release of 1987 would be one of the most prestigious titles they would ever be involved with, The Dead. Based on a short story by James Joyce, would be the 37th and final film to be directed by John Huston. His son Tony would adapt the screenplay, while his daughter Angelica, whom he had directed to a Best Supporting Actress Oscar two years earlier for Pritzi's Honor, would star as the matriarch of an Irish family circa 1904, whose husband discovers memoirs of a deceased lover of his wife's, an affair that preceded their meeting. Originally scheduled to be shot in Dublin, Ireland, the dead would end up shooting on sound stages in Valencia, California, just north of Los Angeles, as the 80-year-old filmmaker was in ill health. Houston was suffering from severe emphysema due to decades of smoking, and he would use video playback for the first and only time in his career in order to call the action. 
whirling around from set to set in a motorized wheelchair with an oxygen tank attached to it. In fact, the company insuring the film required the producers to have a backup director on set just in case Houston was unable to continue the film. That stand-in was Czech-born British filmmaker Karl Weitz, who never once had to stand in during the entire shoot. One Houston who didn't work on the film was Danny Houston, although he was supposed to shoot some second-unit footage for the film in Dublin for his father, who could not make any trips overseas, as well as a documentary about the making of the film, but for whatever reason Danny Houston would end up not doing either. John Houston would turn in his final cut of the film to Vestron in July of 1987, and he would pass away in late August, a good four months before the film's scheduled release. He would not live to see some of the best reviews of his entire career when the film was released on December 18th. At six theaters in Los Angeles and New York City, The Dead would earn $69,000 in its first three days during what was an amazing opening weekend for a number of movies. The Dead would open against exclusive runs of Broadcast News, Ironweed, Moonstruck, and the newest Woody Allen movie, September, as well as wide releases of Eddie Murphy's Raw, Batteries Not Included, Overboard, and the infamous Bill Cosby stinker, Leonard Part 6. The Dead would win the National Society of Film Critics Award for Best Picture of the Year. John Huston would win the Spirit Award and the London Film Critics Circle Award for Best Director. Angelica Huston would win the Spirit Award as well for Best Supporting Actress. And Tony Huston would be nominated for an Academy Award for Best Adapted Screenplay. But the little $3.5 million film would only see modest returns at the box office, grossing just $4.4 million after a four-month run in theaters. Vestron would also release two movies in 1987 through their genre Lightning Pictures label. The first Blood Diner from writer-director Jackie Kong was meant to be both a tribute and an indirect sequel to the infamous 1965 Herschel Gordon Lewis movie Blood Feast, often considered to be the first splatter slasher film. Released on just four screens in Baltimore on July 10, the film would gross just $6,400 in its one-tracked week. The film would get a second chance at life when it opened at the 8th Street Playhouse in New York City on September 4th, but after a $5,000 opening weekend gross there, the film would have to wait until it was released on home video to become a cult film. The other Lightning Pictures release of 1987, Street Trash, would become one of the most infamous horror comedy films of the year, an expansion of a short student film by then 19-year-old Jim Murrow, Street Trash told the twin stories of a Greenpoint, Brooklyn shop owner who sells a case of cheap, long-expired hooch to local hobos, who hideously melt away shortly after drinking it, while two homeless brothers try to deal with their situation as best they can while dealing with all this weirdness that was going on around them. After playing several weeks of midnight shows at the Waverly Theater near Washington Square, Street Trash would open for a regular run at the 8th Street Playhouse on September 18th, one week after Blood Diner left the same theater. However, Street Trash would not replace Blood Diner, which was kicked to the curb after one week, but another long-forgotten movie that Christopher Walken starred Deadline. Street Trash would do a bit better than Blood Diner, $9,000 in its first three days, enough to get the film a full two-week run at the Playhouse. But a second weekend gross of $5,000 would not be enough to give it a longer play date or get it in another New York theater to pick it up. The film would get other playdates, including one in my secondary hometown of Santa Cruz starting ironically on Thanksgiving Day, but the film would barely make $100,000 in its theatrical run. While this would be the only film Jim Murrow would direct, he would become an in-demand cinematographer and steadicam operator, working on such films as Field of Dreams, Dances with Wolves, Sneakers, L.A. Confidential, the first Fast and Furious movie, and On the Abyss, Terminator 2, True Lies, and Titanic for James Cameron. And should you ever watch the film and sit through the credits, yes, it's that Brian Singer who worked as a grip and production assistant on the film. It would be his very first film credit, which he worked on during a break from going to USC film school. People who know me know I'm not the biggest fan of horror film. I may have mentioned it once or twice on this podcast, but I have a soft spot for trauma films and trauma-like films and Street Trash is probably the best trauma movie not to be made or released by trauma. 
there's a reason why Lloyd Kaufman is not a fan of the film. A number of people who have seen the movie think it's a trauma movie, not helped by the fact that a number of people who did work on Toxic Avenger went on to work on Street Trash right afterwards. And some fans will even tell Lloyd at conventions that Street Trash is their favorite trauma movie. I mean, it looks like a trauma movie. It feels like a trauma movie. And to be honest, at least to me, that's one hell of a compliment. It's one of the reasons I even went to see Street Trash, the favorable comparison to trauma. And while I, for lack of a better word, enjoyed Street Trash when I saw it, as much as one can say they enjoyed a movie where a bunch of bums playing hot potato with a man severed Johnson is a major set piece, but I've never really felt the need to watch it again over the past 35 years. Like several of the movies on this episode, Street Trash is not available for streaming on any service in the United States. Outside of Dirty Dancing, which is available on many streaming platforms, the ones you can stream, China Girl, Personal Services, Slaughter High, and Steel Dawn, are available for free with ads on Tubi, which made a huge splash last week with the confounding Super Bowl commercial that sent millions of people onto Google to figure out what a Tubi is. Now, if you were counting, that was only nine films released in 1987 and not the 18 that they had promised at the start of the year. Despite the fact that they had a smash hit in Dirty Dancing, they decided to push most of their planned 1987 movies to 1988. Not necessarily by choice, though. Many of the films just weren't ready in time for a 1987 release. And then the unexpected long-term success of Dirty Dancing kept them occupied for most of the rest of the year. But that only meant that 1988 would be a stellar year for them, right? We'll find out next episode when we continue the Vestron picture story. Thank you for joining us. We'll talk again next week. Remember to visit this episode's page on our website, the80smoviepodcast.com, for extra materials about the movies we covered on this episode. The 80s Movie Podcast has been researched, written, narrated, and edited by Edward Havens for idiosyncratic entertainment. Thank you again. Good night. Good night.